Hi everybody and welcome to the Scottish Summit 2021. Uh, I can't believe it's been 12 months since we were doing this live in Glasgow last year. Uh, unfortunately we're virtual but also very fortunate that we get to have so many more of you attending our session so thank you so much for coming. What I'm going to be talking about today is a little bit of a change compared to what I normally do. Normally I will try and do quite a technical session but there are things that we need to take into consideration before we develop, before we actually create things. And so what we are doing in this session is a pre 101. So before we even touch the tools, what do I need to know? How do I need to think? What are the sorts of considerations I need to take into? Before I get started, first of all, I'd just like to give big love to our sponsors. So without these guys, these, these events just don't happen, they don't work. It's because of these guys, because of the support they are giving to us in the community that means that the, uh, that myself and so many others uh, can, uh, can really be here to try and help uh, help you and share ex our experiences. But they all, they're also um, here because of, for, for you. Um, so they are here to talk about what they do, how they can help you, uh, and they are really putting, uh, putting on, this e on this event. So big thank you to our sponsors. So please do give them some love. Um, if you can, go and, uh, go and visit them, go and have a chat with their, uh, with their teams, uh, because they will be happy to really uh, tell you about what they do and how they may actually be able to work with you in the future. So I'm gonna introduce myself properly now. My name's Matt Weston. I'm the managing director of a small consultancy in the Midlands called Vantage365. So we specialize in what I call the collaboration stack. So that's SharePoint teams, but very much the power apps and the power automate space. And what we try and do is we try and help our customers and also other people within the community to get more out of the, uh, out of the platform, particularly again, around the power platform. I do run a couple of user groups, so I spend a lot of time helping people to understand Power Ups and Power Automate through the Black Country pa uh, Power Platform user group. And I also run an Office 365 user group, the West Midlands 0365 user group. Uh, and we generally meet at the moment virtually on a quarterly basis. If you do want to reach out to me with any questions following the session, please do feel free to reach out to me. You can find me on Twitter at MattWeston365 or you can find me on LinkedIn as well. So please do reach out. I'll be happy to give you any help that you need going forward. So what are we going to be talking about today then? Well, I've already said that this is a non-technical session. So I'm going to refer to the technology a little bit later on. But to start with, we are really going to be stepping away from the flow. We're gonna step back from the technology. And I'm going to share with you my approach to how I start to plan my flows, particularly if they're quite complex, before I even start getting in and starting to try and, and build something. Because I'll hold my hands up, I've come unstuck so many times because I've not, maybe not considered all of the potential ways through a process. Maybe there are certain gotchas in the process that I hadn't considered. And I've fallen foul of those far too many times. So now, before I actually start creating anything, I will follow a basic five-step process to actually get me to the point where I can start developing in anger. And I'm gonna share that with you to try and help you shape that mindset. Try and shape the way that you ask your questions, the way that you look at what you're trying to do. Because I'm hoping that by understanding my mindset that you will also be able to take some of these ideas on board and it's going to save you time in the future. That's what I'm interested in, making your experience of using Power Automate better because you have given it some, a lot more forethought and you've planned it all ahead of time. So we're gonna look at the way of thinking. We're gonna look at the way of planning. But then, I'm not just going to talk about it, I'm going to work through an example with you. And it's going to be an example that has been, it's been redacted to protect the, uh, to protect the innocent, but it's an actual flow that I went through and created for a customer. And if I hadn't have gone through the process that I'm going to go through now, then I would have ended up doing quite a lot of rework because there were a lot of touch points that I hadn't actually considered when we'd first spoken through um, what that process was. So how do we get started? What are the first things that I start to think about? 
Well, the first thing is we obviously need to speak about what the uh, about what the actual process is. We need to consider um, what the requirements are. So, if we can talk about what the requirements are, what are the inputs? What uh, what are, are the outcomes? What are our interactions? So these are the key things that we need to start considering. And what's the best way of doing that? Yes, we write it down. Write it down to start with. Make it a story. But once you've written that story, you can map the process. Now for me, I, uh, as, a, as a consultant, I will usually end up drawing in uh, almost every workshop or every meeting that I'm in. And that's purely because a drawing, I can visualize something. The customer or whoever I'm working with can visualize it so they can then start to say, yes, you've got the process right, or actually, no, it doesn't quite work in that way. So not only are you making it clearer for, uh, for you from the word go, but you're also making something that is easy to communicate and easy to understand by maybe the stakeholders, the process owners, so they can also help to point out holes uh, in your thinking or in your logic before you've even, you've even created something. So those are the considerations. And the key one that it always seems to be forgotten, what are the interactions? So when we think about our flows, we think about, oh, I'm going from A to B. But it's not always that simple. Quite often, there might be an A to a B to a C. There might be something sat right in the middle that you hadn't considered about. There might be another interaction that's required. And having the, the understanding of those interactions, again, will really help you start to shape your flow or shape your flows because it might actually highlight that you need more than one. So once we've gone through the process, where do we go next? Well, next, once we've got our map laid out, we've already got some pictures, well, we can start to identify our services. So we now need to start thinking about what are the data sources? Now, we might have free reign over, over what data sources we use. And if you have, that's fantastic. But most of the time, you don't have that much freedom. Uh, so particularly in my world in consultancy, the customers already have an idea or they already have some data stored somewhere that they want to use going forward. And yes, you can have the conversations with them about what those services are and how they can be used or maybe how they can do it better. And that's, and that's your prerogative as, as maybe someone who's giving that advice to try and bring people on board with that. But the key thing is you are thinking about what services do I need? Where are we storing our data? What outputs do we need? Because I need to now start thinking about how am I going to communicate with a user? How am I going to communicate with a stakeholder? Is it going to be via email? Is it going to be through Teams? And where uh, am I outputting out to a different data source? So each of these things, again, really focuses your mind on starting to think about what I actually need to get my flow in the first place. But what does this really highlight and where has this really proved useful for me is particularly when I'm looking at services, it highlights where me as a user, uh, if I'm doing it as me or if I'm doing it as an automation account, it's highlighting where my permission, uh, my permission thinking needs to come in. So if I'm interacting with a service, if I'm interacting with a data source, do I have the permissions that I need in order to go and start using that? So again, by thinking about those services, I can start thinking ahead uh, to maybe to start asking the questions, have I can, uh, can you give me access to that, please? Have I got the right? Uh, have I got the rights to be able to do everything that I need to do? So again, doing this thinking ahead, that's going to save me getting halfway through my flow, and all of a sudden realizing I haven't got the rights to do what I need to do. But the big thing again, I always I always seem to save the big one to the very last one. As I'm thinking through my services. This is going to help me think about what licensing do I need? Am I okay with just standard licensing or the seeded licensing? Or do I need to go and interact with services or use actions or services um, or connectors that require a premium license? And if I require that premium licensing, how do I license it? Because that's a conversation in its own right that you will need to have with, uh, with the process owner. Particularly if you're going down the per process licensing, uh, if you're going down the per user licensing, how many do I, uh, uh, for per user, how many do I need? How many people actually need to interact with this in order for, uh, for, me, to uh, for me to go and buy the correct number of licenses? So again, 
thinking of these things ahead, it's not just identifying, oh, I'm going to store some information in Excel. I'm going to store some information in Dataverse. It's actually more than that. It's allowing you to have that forethought and that, uh, and that, uh, and that foresight to go and have the conversations again to make sure that you have everything in place before you actually get going. So what have we thought about so far? We've thought about um, our process and we've mapped it. We've thought about what services we need. And all of our processes are going to start somewhere. So what is our starting point? So think about what we've got in Cloudflows. We've got three potential types of trigger. We've got our instant triggers, which require a human, a human to go and do something and press a button or something to actually get it going in the first place. So is that, is what, is that what's going to start our flows? Is it something that's going to react to the user going and doing something in a different service so we can start using our automate, uh, automatic triggers? Or is it something that's going to fire on a, uh, on a, on a recurrent basis so I can start to think about my, uh, my recurrence and my schedules? So again, thinking about the starting point, we're thinking about what is going to start the whole process. But again, key to this, what are our human interactions? Because again, I'll hold my hands up. I've thought this, I've fallen into this trap that I thought, actually, we've only got one start point for this process. But once you start looking at your human interactions, then it may be that you start to actually have more than one start point because you might actually need to break down your process into numerous flows. So now I'm not just dealing with one start point, I'm starting with several. So again, think about the, where those touch points are because again, it's not just, it's going to be the same, uh, the same uh, trigger potentially every single time. It could be that one is based on a, an automatic trigger, another one is based on somebody actually going and pressing the button, and the next one could be it's gonna run at 12 o'clock every day and send out reminders based on, uh, based on the process. So there are different things, different uh, automations, different triggers, and so different start points that you need to consider when you're going through each stage of your process. But again, the elephant in the room, how long does the process last? Because think of the limitations that we have, uh, our flows will only run for a specific amount of time before they time out. So if I know that my process is going to be going longer than, uh, than 30 days, then do I now need to start considering again, breaking down my flow into its constituent, so, uh, almost like subflows? And if that's the case, then once again, it's not the human interaction element that's now introducing those additional start points. It's the limitations of the technology itself. So again, all of these key things, where do we start? Something that really does need that little bit of thinking about. Don't go headlong into thinking, actually, yes, I know what that's going to be. Step back, have that little Hamlet moment and just give some consideration to what is actually going to kick everything off. Also, let's break it into sections. So don't be a hero. Don't try and tackle everything in one go because you don't need to do that. You can really iterate through your, through your build and we'll talk about that in a moment. But break it down into sections. Think about, first of all, how many flows do I need? Because that is going to break your process down into individual sections. So immediately we're taking what is a quite a big process and we're simplifying it by making it a much, uh, uh, a much smaller, uh, or a several much smaller processes. So let's, let's talk it through. So how many flows do I need? We've spoken about that based on our interactions, based on the number of triggers that we're going to actually need. So I'm quite happy with that. I'm thinking about that already. But when we talk about breaking into the sections, we've spoken about breaking the process down. But you know what? You can break your, your actual individual cloud flows down as well. And I'll show you some of the ways that I like to do that because again, it just helps me put that scaf scaffold into place, almost pseudocode style, uh, before I actually start developing. So are there specific stages that we can really break our flows down into so that we can give that some consideration before we even start building? And then finally, how do we group the stages together? How do we group our actions together? Because if we can break, uh, and that feeds into the previous bullet points, if I can br uh, start to group stages together um, or uh, group actions together into specific stages, and you know what, again, I'm breaking down what could be quite a complex flow into manageable pieces. 
So whilst it might seem like, actually, this is a lot of hard work, it's a lot of thinking power that's, that's going into it, you know what, it, it is going to be uh, really put you into a good footing uh, for the next stage. And the next stage, build, test, and adjust. No matter how good you think you are at flows, it's, n it's never going to be 100% right straight away, unless it's a very, very simple flow, in which case you can just go uh, action one, action two, action three, job done, right, I'm going to the pub because I've, I've just built a fantastic flow. As soon as you start getting something a little bit more complex, you know what, you need to then really start to iterate through it. And the way that I tend to do that is I will break it down into, into chunks like we mentioned in the previous, uh, on the previous slide. But now I'm going to build it and I'm going to build maybe a small section of, of it. Once I've built that small section, then I'm going to test it. Because as I go through those tests, I can then start to see how, my, how I'm starting to interact with my data. Because again, if we can, uh, rather than tackling it all in one go and then realizing that I've gone down a complete rabbit hole, this is going to help me highlight exactly um, any issues and allow me to rectify them before they become a major problem. And this really has a lot of uh, has a lot of uh, synch uh, synchronies with um, with DevOps. So the whole point of DevOps is that you it, small iterations, small quick builds. You build, you test. Uh, you deploy, you build, you test, you deploy, and you keep going around that circle. It's pretty much the same with our automations. We build something, we test it. If we need to tweak it, we tweak it. If not, we move on to the next piece. So what I tend to do is I tend to break down in that way, but then I tend to focus on a specific journey through my flow. So build the positive route first. So if you're going through your conditions, go through uh, go through almost like the um, the utopian route through. Everything's going to go through. Everything's going to be approved. Everything's going to work in exactly the way that I want it to. And so you can then work your way down through your process. Once you're happy with that, we can now start to think about adding the, uh, what I call the negative routes. So what happens if, in, for example, something uh, is rejected? What happens if uh, something comes back with a value that is different to what I actually want to come out? So you need to start thinking about now, not just the positive route through. Yeah, we're all, uh, we're all optimists, so we all think it's gonna go uh, the way we expect it to. Well, as soon as the users get it, it's never gonna go that way. So we can then start to think about what happens, where are our negative routes, where do we need to get maybe branch off or loop around um, in order to make sure that we capture all of those different scenarios. And pretty much once you've gone through that, once you've gone through your different stories, and it might be that you've got multiple positive routes, multiple negative routes through, once you've got that, then you can start to think about the bells and whistles. Because think about it, you've got your foundation now, you've built something that's solid, it's something that's working. So now let's start to bring in our efficiencies. Let's start to think about how can we make our flow run, uh, run more effectively? Do I actually need to loop there or can I maybe use queries instead to maybe make that a little bit more efficient? Maybe I can change uh, some of my uh, get items that are just pulling everything out and I'm going to use some filter queries to make that more efficient. So start thinking now about, uh, uh, we can now start thinking about the performance aspect as well. But if we got too bogged down in that to start off with, before we've got the process right, your whole mindset can become so fixed on trying to make something efficient, trying to make something flashy, when you haven't actually got the basics in place first of all. And then finally, we can we can add any additional pieces on there, like adding uh, error handling. So bringing in some scopes, maybe to go and uh, do a try catch, uh, bringing in anything else that we need, um, we can then start to bring in all of the additional pieces that are uh, that really take our flow from just being a bog standard uh, basic flow to being something that's production and enterprise worthy. So now that we've gone through those five stages, let's actually go and work through a live example. So all those things that we've just done, we are going to apply into something that I've actually delivered for a customer. So here's the process that I was given. So basically, the customer that I was working for had a funding request. 
They were originally doing it using Excel, uh, using paper forms, tracking them in Excel spreadsheets, sending attachments via email, um, you name it, all the things that the, the inner information manager in me is, I can hear him screaming now about, uh, about how the process used to be. Um, we, uh, the customer wanted to make it completely electronic. So we needed a way of being able to capture um, some, fu uh, some funding request information. And it was then going to go back to the customer, uh, back to the, the person who raised the request to build the use case around it, provide some documents, and then submit it to a committee for approval. Now that committee was able uh, to make a number of decisions. They were able to decide whether it was going to go ahead as an OPEX um, funding request, whether it was going to go forward as a CAPEX request, whether it was going to, uh, whether they were going to send it back to the nominee for uh, further clarification, or whether they were just going to say, sorry, no, no way, uh, we're not having that one. So a full out rejection. So we've got potentially four routes out of that, uh, out of that first approval process. If it was actually classed as a CAPEX request, then it had to go to a further stage of approval. Before it did that, it needed to go back to the nominee again because they needed to produce a, uh, a PowerPoint presentation which supported their request for funding. So they actually had some more work to do. Now, all of that going from one end of the process through the, uh, through the first use case building, through the uh, first round of approvals, going through the second, uh, if we had to go to the second level, going through that second level of use case uh, or um, PowerPoint presentation production through to final um, uh, final approval, that could have been quite a long process because each of those uh, approval committees only met once a month. So if I'm unlucky enough to, get a uh, to be asked for further clarification or if I miss one particular uh, committee, uh, committee approval, then it could be that my approval process might actually be taking a couple of months. So these are the sort of things that I had to consider. So let's go and put that into the way that we plan it. So what was the first stage? Well, we've got the outline, we've got the story. So the first thing that we did was map the process. Now you don't have to be an absolute Visio wizard uh, to actually go and do this. Because as long as you can understand a route through the process, then you know what, you're, you're in a good place. So what I've got here is I've got my route through. So I've got my funding request being submitted. It's going to save some information somewhere. It's going to um, send an e a couple of emails. Um, that's going to then um, be submitted for review. And it's then going to go through all of those different arms. Now, when I spoke through it first of all, you probably thought, um, quite rightly actually, that seems fairly simple. But the thing that caught me out when, uh, when I first started thinking this through is the fact that actually the sa that same funding request could go through the committee review and approval a number of times. Because if each time I'm being asked for more info, then I need to be able to be able to go through that in a user controlled loop. So that's something that if you uh, remember what I said that the committee meet, uh, committees meet once a month. So I could be looking at a three, maybe if I'm unlucky, four month um, um, cycle to actually get that through. But then I've got the all the additional touch points there. So I've got the, uh, if it's approved for the CapEx, um, then we're going to email them. We're going to request a pitch uh, template to be created. Um, we're going to update some information and then eventually we're going to go through the second level of, of approval. So all of these bits and pieces together form our overall process. So now that we've looked at the overall process, what do we do now? What was, set, what was stage two? Yeah, you're absolutely right. It was identify your services. So if I come back to my, uh, uh, my flowchart again, so here I've overlaid some of the services that I know I need to use to satisfy each of these different stages. So the customer had already made the uh, made a decision themselves that they wanted to use Microsoft Forms as the way that they uh, that the whole process started. So for them, it meant that they could easily go and update a form. They could put new questions on there if they wanted to. They could change some of the uh, some of the choice fields. 
Um, but they could also just have posters dotted around with a QR code on that could be scanned nice and easily and it would take them to the form and they didn't need to worry about anything else technical about that. So they were quite happy with forms as being the starting point. But then they were using an Excel spreadsheet before. Um, so we looked at different ways of them being able to store the information. What did they want to do with it? Uh, were they able to get the sign off for premium licensing? Uh, the answer in this case was no, that it had to be, um, they had to be done um, within the confines of their Microsoft 365 licensing. So where, where's the most likely place for an Excel spreadsheet to go? Well, it's to, be, to convert it to a SharePoint list. But what we actually did in this scenario, just going off on a bit of a tangent, is because we wanted to group all of the documents together that, uh, in one place, we ended up using document sets. Uh, so the, um, the files, that are the actual information itself, was stored as metadata against effectively a folder. All the documents went into that folder, so from a, a, an information architecture and organization point of view, it was actually an improvement on the process that, they, um, uh, that they'd already uh, got in place. But either way, I need to be able to interact with SharePoint in order to be able to set, store my information. How are we going to send our, um, our messages out or our acknowledgements and so on? Well, we could use Teams. Not everybody on the, in the organization is, is using Teams at the moment, so they're still going through that rollout. So we had to rely on email. So that means that I need to use the Outlook service, uh, uh, service connector in order to go and send out those notifications. And the whole process carries on. As you can see, it's fairly simple in terms of all the different uh, connectors, all the different services that I need to call and use within my flow. It's pretty much SharePoint and, and Outlook. That's generally all I ended up using. But now that I've done that, I'm quite comfortable. Actually, I've got access to SharePoint. I've got an, uh, I've got a, an outbox. I've got a, or I've got a mailbox, so I can send emails. Um, actually. Some of these need to be sent on behalf of the group mailbox. So now that I know that I'm using Outlook, I now need to go and ask for delegate, uh, send as uh, delegation rights for that mailbox. And I knew that because uh, looking at where Outlook sat in, uh, sat in here, I was able to ask the question, where do the emails need to come from? Um, so I could then start having those questions. And I'm glad I did because it took a while for them to actually give me those rights. But while I was going through this planning process, uh, I wasn't losing any time. The IT team were working concurrently to go and give me what I needed. So quite an efficient, uh, efficient use of time. What was next? Identify where we start. So we've already said that the process itself is quite, is, it's quite obvious where it's going to start. It's going to start with the user filling in the form. So therefore, in my uh, uh, using my knowledge of, uh, of cloud flows, I know that I'm going to be using an automated trigger. Um, I'm going to be grabbing the information from uh, from forms, and I'm going to be doing something with it. So I know immediately that I've got that that uh, that trigger point. But thinking through the process, there's a, there's actually two more starting points that I need to take into consideration. So the first is that I don't know how long it's going to take the users to actually build all um, build the use case and all the support and information that they need to submit for committee review. So I also know that potentially the committee could ask for more information for the user then to submit that uh, back to the um, back, back to the committee again for a further review. So that means that I actually have a start point here as well because I've got uh, a, a, a physical interaction that I need here in order to move on to the next stage. And again, that could be longer than uh, flow allows me to run uh, or hold the flow running. So I now need to uh, think, consider that as a start point. And then finally, exactly the same with the pitch template. So if I, again, I don't know how long it's going to take me to get that pitch template created and how long it's going to take it to actually, uh, take, to actually get in front of the committee. So I've got three potential start points for different flows. So now that I know that I've got three distinct uh, areas in my flow that all have individual start points, I can now go onto my next stage, which was break it down into sections. 
So if I do that, how have I broken it down? Well, basically, I've broken it down into each stage. So I've got a definitive start and end to each part of this. So I ended up, as, as you can probably guess, I ended up with three different flows. The first being stage one. Take the, uh, take the information that's been submitted from flow, store it in SharePoint, send out some notifications. Yeah, that's the, ba that's the basics of what I'm trying to do. So nice and simple. Fair. And actually, because I've broken down that over that big process that could look quite complicated, particularly if you're quite new to flow, actually, I've broken it down into this small piece. Actually, that's only, what, four small bits that I need to do? That's actually much more achievable and much, uh, much less scary than trying to tackle the big one all in one go. So uh, mentally, I'm now much more prepared to go and start tackling this. Let's look at the second one. So I've then got a submit to committee review and approval. Um, so um, how did I start this? Uh, well, I started this but using a for a selected file trigger, and we'll see a, a little bit more of this later on. But I've got a physical um, flow that's been uh, a um, sorry a, phys a, a an actual trigger, an instant trigger that's being fired because the person is going and interacting to say, I am now ready for you to run. Again, not waiting for Flow to, uh, to, uh, to sit there. I'm asking the user to go and say, uh, say right, I am ready. I've put all of my documents into that, fo uh, into that folder. You now have everything that you need to go and make a decision on my funding request. So I'm going to press the button and away we go. We start, uh, we break out into the Flow again. So again, Fairly strict, fairly simple. That looked like, in the bigger, a bigger piece, it looked like a huge piece of work. But when you break it down into this small section, it's not actually that big. It's a trigger. It's an approval. And uh, it's, a, it's uh, dealing with the outcomes. Now, out of all of the pieces, this, is probably, this has probably got the most actions. But in terms of the logic, it's fairly straightforward. And because uh, all I need to do, what do I need to do? What are my outputs? Well, my outputs are generally emails uh, and they are updating information in SharePoint. So again, something that's, uh, that is, if, uh, if I go then go to a 101 session on Flow, is going to be covered. So I'm happy that everything at the moment is still within the skill set. And again, it's not an insurmountable amount of work. Then the final part. So Break it down into the uh, uh, broken it down into the three flows. So again, I've got a uh, something which is started based on um, the template being submitted for review. And again, we've got a couple of outputs. We've got some SharePoint uh, SharePoint updates going on. We've got some emails going out. Um, so again, not a huge flow on its own. But when you consider how big it was when it was all together, it looked like an absolute beast. So now that I've broken down the overall flow into its constituent parts, let's do exactly the same with the actual, uh, the actual flow itself. So I can easily identify each part. So I can say, get my submission info. And that's going to be the information that I capture maybe through the trigger, or maybe I just take, uh, maybe it's information that's put uh, as metadata onto the document set and I can pick it up from there. I can then manage the approval and I can then handle the escalation for the CAPEX. So I can then maybe uh, set some different statuses, maybe send some different notifications based on uh, uh, it going through the CAPEX route. But no matter how I come, up, come to this, whether I come to it through the form route, and you know what, it's going straight for approval, or whether I'm going round uh, because I've been asked to provide more info, I can, come and I can come around this and I can go through these stages every single time. So now that we've broken down the overarching flow into sections, we've broken down that one flow, and you can do it for the other two as well, we've broken down the, uh, the biggest flow into really three sections. So even now, even though I said that that's probably the, uh, the most in terms of actions, I've only got to think about three potential parts. How I get the information, how, uh, how I handle the approval, and then how I handle the escalation if it needs to go further. 
So, now it comes the fun part. We've done all the planning. I've got it clear in my head how I'm going to do it, but let's start to translate it now into flow. Now, the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm still not going to go headlong into going and creating all of my logic. So the three sections that I outlined in my initial uh, in my initial plan, I am going to basically translate that into my flow. And I like to I love using scopes. I'm going to use some scopes for this. So I'm going to use a scope for getting the submission info. I'm going to use a scope for managing the approval. And I'm going to use a scope for escalating my capex. So now all of the actions to, for each of these sections is going to go in each of these scopes. So again, I'm concentrating on focusing on that one specific objective for that part of the flow. Mentally, still breaking it down even further each time I start to look at this. So once I start actually getting into there, I can now think, okay, so I need to get my submission info. Now my trigger I'd already decided was based on get uh, on for a selected file within SharePoint, but that doesn't uh, but that doesn't give me everything that I need. So what information do I actually need to support the information uh, to support the rest of my flow going forward? Well, I'm more than likely going to need to get the file properties for the f uh, for the overarching document set so that I can uh, get all of my metadata. But is there anything else that I need further on? Well, actually, I'm going to need some of the user profile information because it might be that I actually need to go and call depart uh, uh, provide departments or I need to go and put, uh, find out managers, manager details, whatever it might be. Uh, I might need to go and get information from elsewhere in order for me to be able to go and grab that, uh, grab that information. But very focused. And because I can expand and collapse my scopes, I can, concentrate, I can expand my scope uh, for get submission info to become open. I can do what I need to. I'm then going to go and test it. And I'm going to test to make sure that I'm getting the right information back. Once I've tested that, yep, happy days, thumbs up, pat on the back mat, uh, uh, for Matt. I'm going to shrink that scope back down. I'm going to go and expand out my second one and we're going to work through it in that way. So now, I'm happy that the first part is working and it's giving me the information that I want. I'm now going to focus on the managing the approval. So I'm going to look back at my, my, at my process diagram and I'm going to go, actually, how many items do I need there? So I'm going to start and wait for an approval. But because a, a standard, uh, standard approval just has approve and reject, actually, that's not going to work for me because I can count one, two, three, four on my, uh, on my process diagram to say, actually, there's four potential outcomes from that approval. So I need to maybe think about using um, one of the custom options uh, to, to actually go ahead and, and uh, ask for, is it a CAPEX approval? Is it an OPEX approval? Uh, is it an outright rejection? Or are we going to ask for more information? There's four ways through. And again, because I know that, I can start thinking about how, uh, how can I start to um, uh, handle the logic or handle the outcomes from my, uh, from my approval? Well, I know that I've got more than two outcomes, so I can't just use a, a condition. Well, I could. I could have if, 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 but what I'm going to choose to do instead is I'm going to use a switch and I'm going to have an individual leg for every single outcome. And again, I didn't have to think about that because I've mapped it. I understand my process. I can uh, and I can physically, if I need to, I can go and uh, count, uh, count the boxes. Once I'm happy with that, again, shrink it down. Next one, open it up. Escalating for the capex. So what do I need to do uh, for that? Well, actually, I'm going to I'm going to copy the, uh, the 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 template into the folder so it's already there for the uh, for that person. I'm going to create a sharing link for them so that they can go and directly access it, and I'm going to email that out to them so that they've got um, uh, they've got a notification say, well done, you've been, uh, you've made it through the first. Uh, made it through the first committee review. You are now going to have um, have to go and create this new PowerPoint presentation. Here's a link to it, go for it. And then that's it, that's the end of our, uh, of the basics for our, um, for our flow going through. And then we can go through and we can test each one of those. Um, so that I would go through and I would test the positive routes through. 
I would make sure that I'm testing the negative routes through as well. So I'd also be, uh, so I, once I've developed my positive, develop my negative um, and away we go. So we're quite happy now that we've developed the basics of our flow. But then I said, maybe we can start to think about some of the efficiencies, some of the bells and whistles that we can put on top of that. And it might be something as simple as, I'm gonna make this production ready, so I'm going to provide some additional error handling around that. Um, so I'm gonna build in a try-catch. Uh, it might be that I'm going to provide some additional reporting. Uh, I'm going to fire out some additional information to different lists. It might be that I'm maintaining, uh, maintaining an audit log as it goes through. But all of those things can start to come in once we have got the basics of our flow going through. So I really hope that just going through my thought processes there is going to help you going forward. I, I, I can't recommend more highly that you think about your flows before you dive in and help, uh, or before you actually dive in and get going. Uh, from my point of view, yeah, absolutely. I will uh, quite often go headlong into, into thinking, yeah, I understand that process. And I'll get th so far through it and then I'll suddenly have that moment where I, I sit back and think, actually, there's some things here that I haven't considered. But if I was giving that, th uh, that thought process up front, that would save me the time of then having to go maybe reverse engineer things, reverse things back out, or even just go and start, start from scratch again because I've completely gone down a rabbit hole. So thinking about it really is a good exercise to do it up front. It will save you time. It will save you a lot of headache. Um, and it will mean that your time is spent much more efficiently. And I shared with you my five steps of how I do it. You will find your own. You will find a process that works for you. But if you can start with a basis such as mapping the process, thinking about the, uh, thinking about the services that you need to support that process, which in turn helps you think about the licensing. Looking for your start points, not just what is right at the very beginning, but think, as you start to think through your process, think about the different touch points where you need human interaction. And that again highlights the fact that sometimes as humans, we need longer than 30 days to do something. A process could be quite a, a long drawn out process. So do you need multiple start points in order to make sure that your flow is going to continue to run and your process is going to be effective even if we step outside of the normal limits of what the technology allows us to do? If you have a beast of a process, break it down. Break it down into, uh, if you can, break it down into individual flows. So have a flow focused on a specific part of the process something that is going to be much more manageable, something that's going to be much more maintainable going forward because it's not this monolithic um, bunch of actions that uh, are all going from A to B. And even with, once you've broken those, uh, that big process down into your smaller processes, think about how you can break it down into, into your individual actions or into, into your individual stages and use scopes. So scopes are a fantastic tool for being able to highlight, that's what I'm going to do in that bit, that's what I'm going to do in the next bit, that's what I'm going to do here. So even though our, sub our broken down processes might still look quite large, again, break them down into those individual stages and they will become bite-sized. And you know what, once they're bite-sized, you can really tackle them, you can start to pick them off. And then finally, iterate through the development. Don't, try, don't be a hero, don't try and tackle it all in one go. Um, even, um, even I still go and build a little bit. I'll test. I'll make sure it's right. I'll go and do the next bit and I'll test and then I'll, I'll make sure it's right. And I will keep going through that process time and time again until I'm happy that I've got the process exactly as I want it to, that it's going to work for both the positive route and also the negative routes uh, through my process. So iterate, iterate through it. Don't, uh, don't try and bite off more than you can chew. And like I said, find a process that works for you. You will find your way of doing things. And, the, and what is the right way? The right way is your way. Yeah, you might, if you choose my way, absolutely fantastic, I'm happy. But find your way, find what works for you, and you will be able to carry that through. So that just bring, that brings me to uh, the end of the session. So thank you very much for attending. I hope it's been useful. Um, I hope that you have followed that, uh, that through yourselves and I, I do hope it, uh, it does give you some benefit going forward. 
I do hope you enjoy the rest of the summit. There are some fantastic speakers, some fantastic sessions. Uh, there's so much to go and choose from. Um, so I'm going to go and actually jump into some sessions that I wouldn't normally go and attend. So I'm going to start uh, start watching those. Um, again, please do feel free to give some love to uh, the sponsors. And if you, uh, as you're posting through uh, through the day, please do, uh, if you're on social media, please do use the hashtag, hashtag Scottish Summit 2021. Uh, they will get picked up. Uh, they will help to really spread the word, spread the love about what we're doing here. Um, but for, for now, enjoy the rest of the conference. And I'll hopefully see you in person at the Scottish Summit in 2022.